So uh, my name is John Kennedy. I'm the program manager for uh, the D8 module acceleration program. I'm going to give you a little intro to uh, what we've tried to achieve over the last six months. Um, but mainly, uh, it's about the panel. Uh, these guys are amazing developers uh, who've come together to accelerate the Drupal 8 module ecosystem with that be porting or creating new modules to drive uh, Drupal adoption. We'll have a lot of time in this session for you to ask them questions about, uh, about the challenges they faced, about what's ready in D8, about how to do things. Uh, so, you know, if you want, have questions ready for the end. Um, I'm also going to touch very briefly, because it's a business showcase session, on uh, Lightning, which is an open source distribution we've been building with the help of a lot of the modules we've had. Feel free to come on down to the front of the room. Yeah, plenty of seats up the front of the room. Um, and. Uh, and so let's, let's uh, get into it. Um, I'm, I'm going to introduce, introduce everyone first. Uh, we've got Ken from Palantir, uh, Larry here, who's uh, with Platform SH. We've got Adam, who's my tech lead. And we've got David Snowpack. Uh, and we've got Dick Olson and Tim Millwood and Ted Bowman. Um, and uh, and um, Adam's with me. Uh, David? Uh, so I'm a Drupal consultant. I also uh, work for MindDraft Wizard. We do Drupal support and maintenance. And uh, hand it on down. And my name is Dick. Um, so I work for Pfizer, big pharmaceutical company. Uh, we use Drupal for our marketing websites. Uh, so yeah, I'm a, also, apart from Pfizer, I'm a long time contributor to both core and contrib maintainer of the deploy module and a few other bits and pieces. I'm Tim, uh, I work for Amnovation, and I've been working with uh, Dick on the workflow initiative stuff. Uh, Ted Bowman, Ted Bow on Drupal.org, and at the time I was doing this, I was a contractor with them. Now I'm uh, working at the office of the CTO at Acquia, um, and I guess long time in contrib contributor. Now you've got to hand it to the other end, because you're all doing formal introductions, so bring it back to Ken. <laughs> I'm Ken Rickard. I'm the director of professional services at Palantir. Uh, it's funny because I was a longtime Drupal contributor, and now I'm in the business side. So, uh, interesting perspective that Ken will yeah, bring. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm a product owner actually, <laughs> uh, but I can develop. <laughs> I'm Larry Garfield, been around Drupal forever. Um, the stuff we're talking about here uh, was when I worked at Palantir.net with Ken. Uh, I just recently moved to Platform SH, it's a hosting company. Um, so yeah, I'm just talking about code, uh, because that's most of what I was doing for this initiative. And I'm Adam Balsam, um, I work for Acquia, I'm the tech lead for Lightning, and I helped organize this module acceleration program with John. Great. So I'm going to talk really briefly about uh, the purpose for the initiative, um, because what we found uh, when we looked, and this actually is a set of functionalities from Forrester, who are an analyst, they look at web content management systems. But when we looked at these capabilities, on left you see what's provided by uh, Drupal core, but on, your, on the right you see all the things that have to be provided by uh, the module ecosystem, at least until we bring them into core. And so that really puts uh, you know, a lot of responsibility on the ecosystem to put out these features for Drupal 8 so that people have a full and rich uh, experience with Drupal. Uh, so, you know, recently, uh, as Dries said in his keynote, uh, he did a survey. And what did he find is the top reason people weren't coming to D8? Uh, modules. You know, they needed uh, to, to feel uh, that modules were in a state they could use in production. Uh, they had the capabilities they needed to build uh, digital experiences. So, you know, we had a mission in, in October. And uh, this really kicked off uh, with the uh, authoring summit uh, that we had over at Bad Camp. Uh, where we gathered a lot of people together to talk about authoring experiences and modules and you know, what was required to bring people into Drupal 8. Uh, and you know, the, the mission for the Module Acceleration Program, uh, which was to drive Drupal 8 adoption, to engage the module contributors, and to build a better Drupal. So Acquia put the money forward. Uh, you know, they, they put forward, we put forward <laughs> $500,000. Thank you, Tom. Uh, to go t directly to contributors. Um, you know, we, as I said before, we, uh, we went out to Bad Camp and other, a number of other places to, uh, to engage the community. 
Um, and we also supported this development uh, with resources from Acquia that was a part of our professional services department and also Adam Baltham, who's uh, the technical lead and, and coordinated the whole program uh, from a technical standpoint. So, you know, after six months, uh, we've got over 4,000 hours of developer time uh, in the program. Uh, we've got over 10 contributing agencies uh, who couldn't necessarily be represented here. A lot of them are in Europe. Uh, you know, as you can see, over six countries, over 20 developers, and we've released over 36 uh, production-ready modules. And generally, they're the tough ones. <laughs> uh, they're, they're big, hard modules that we knew were going to be really hard to accomplish uh, for a single developer, and it made sense to try and develop them as a part of a, a group effort. So uh, maybe, Adam, you can take up the mic and just talk really briefly about how we can coordinate it across a lot of different modules that are being uh, developed independently. Uh, by groups of people. Yeah, this is our uh, Trello board that we use to just kind of get like a general overview of where we were at with all of our modules. So first of all, we identified what modules belonged on here. Um, and then we built our team out. And some of the people that we brought on were very specific, like Larry. Um, he worked primarily on workbench moderation, which was a module that he already owned. Um, he actually inherited some of that work from somebody else with the Drupal 8 version. But um, then there was other things that um, we didn't necessarily have somebody uh, in mind when we knew that we had to port it. So it was really a matter of figuring out you know, personalities and where the expertise lied, who preferred to work on a team, who preferred to work individually. Um, and you know, throughout that, you know, somebody like uh, Wampi, uh, who came to us from Lullabot, I think he touched well over a dozen modules, um, not necessarily you know, porting them straight from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, but without him, they probably, you know, there was issues that would have languished, that needed review. Um, then you had people like Larry, who worked primarily just on one module, and then um, people like uh, Ted who bounced around, but you know, ultimately you know, developed entire modules. So it was really a matter of like, finding the right personalities and the right technical chops and uh, you know, uh, letting, letting people kind of direct their own um, uh, destinies. Um, I don't think people would have appreciated you know, saying, you know, I wouldn't have asked David, uh, who is very involved in the panels ecosystem, to work on workbench moderation. Um, so people kind of migrated to what they knew best and it really worked out well. Yeah, and this was a lot about people who wanted to uh, develop their modules. They wanted to do the ports, uh, but they didn't have the time or they couldn't justify it, and we brought them together. And then uh, there were also people who came in, uh, like D Dick and Tim, who uh, had projects and donated their time. So Pfizer donated time and, Medi and, uh, and AppNovation donated time into the program because they had their own uh, problems they were solving, and we could help them with that as well, uh, contribute to their effort, uh, in some ways, and they were contributing to ours as well. Um, and that, it really grew the effort out beyond who we were funding directly uh, to parties who wanted to collaborate. And, you know, we ended up, Adam, uh, with, with a few externals, um, and we, we kind of had uh, the, the daily scrum, but also we had an external meeting that was happening every week. Right, that's important to note. Yeah, so what we started doing is we picked a time that people in... Switzerland and India and the East Coast and Oklahoma could all make. Um, so every day, we got together at 10.15 a.m. my time. Boston. <laughs> which may have been 10.45 p.m. for some other people that were involved in the project. Um, but every day, we made it a point that we all got together and talked for at least 15 minutes. Um, that was our daily stand-up. Um, I think that was really useful. Um, you know, a lot of times it was, yeah, I'm still working on it. Um, but it was just really good to touch base um, every day. And then on Tuesdays, what we did is we, uh, we called that our external scrum. So everybody that came to our daily meetings um, came to Tuesday. But we also invited you know, some managers and then some other organizations that are doing similar um, acceleration efforts. So maybe they were working on projects that were related or not related, but it was a good time to bring everybody together and say, um, you know, uh, we're picking up uh, the DMAPS module, so don't anybody else worry about that, or we need help with this. Um, and maybe uh, somebody could jump in and, and review an issue for them or something. So on Tuesdays, we kind of had our bigger uh, meeting that we caught everybody up, and then every day we tried to keep it quick. Um, our stand up at 10:15, and that seemed to be really productive. It was really, really uh, useful, uh, use, good use of time. Right. So I just wanted to mention, you know, as a as part of this effort was to to get D8 going, and now we're seeing a large adoption of D8. And Drew's talked about it in his keynote, but now we're seeing large companies come on to D8. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, of uh, sites reporting on Ddodo. Uh, a lot of sites on, on our queer platform uh, that we can measure, um, you know, and, and we think that uh, the module acceleration program has been a part of that, and some of the reason we believe that is we look at the top 12 modules uh, that we, we built as a part of the, 
the, the program and we see big adoption of those modules between January and April. Uh, you know, we launched in October, we probably started releasing modules in January um, and we've seen you know, a lot of adoption of those modules uh, since then. <laughs> so we're going to go to questions now and this is the real, uh, this is the real uh, point of, of the discussion because I think the point today is that we want to enable people uh, to, to form groups uh, as we did within the program uh, to, and go after these, these initiatives that, that Dries is talking about and self-organize and get uh, more modules ported and more functionality into D8. Uh, you know, and these guys have had on-the-ground experience of how to self-coordinate and you know, they've set up subgroups around uh, things like uh, workflow um, and you know, that's been really successful. Um, so, you know, I'd like uh, the developers on the panel maybe to pick out a, a question they would like to answer and uh, we'll go down and uh, we'll go person by person. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, we can uh, pass the microphone across and uh, guys? So, uh, this is Larry. Um, for the recording, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I work primarily on Workbench moderation. Um, I also did some work with the workspaces and multi-version uh, modules as well. Uh, for Workbench Moderation, it's a module that Palantir developed originally for Drupal 7, and we knew we wanted to you know, redo it for Drupal 8. Uh, there had been changes in Drupal 8 that made it a lot easier to build, even just some minor uh, changes in the core APIs that took out several thousand lines of terrible, ugly code uh, from the Drupal 7 version of the module. Probably the biggest uh, question we had, though, and I'll answer that one, <laughs> uh, yeah, the hard decisions was <clears throat> in Drupal 7 we had two different versions of Workbench moderation. We had the Workbench uh, 1.x branch, which was basically you know your straightforward build a couple of states that you know assign them to uh, nodes and moderate them and you're done. Uh, and then a 2.x branch that was trying to be a much more robust kind of workflow engine type thing um, that for various reasons never fully solidified. And the question for Drupal 8 was, all right, which approach do we take? You know, do we want to do the 75% use case that we can nail pretty straightforward, but in doing so not be able to get to that last 10%, and maybe that middle 15, if I can do math? Or do we try and get to that 90% with the one module? Do we you know, do that 70, 75% version and then hope that tying into multi-version and workspace, that other 15% will just kind of happen on its own. Um, and we went around on that for, actually, even pre-map, we were having that discussion internally and tried taking one approach, didn't quite work. Finally, with map, we were talking about it, that, all right, we'll take this junior approach and then Lee Rowland, you know, Laraland, um, did a quick proof of concept for us and said, by the way, I have this proof of concept. And we said, oh, okay, yay GPL, go community. And so I decided, you know, Workbench is going to be the, I'm going to say low end module. Uh, it's going to be the, the simple, straightforward version, not the uh, kitchen sink approach. And we'll just do that and see where it lands. And that was a gamble to an extent to say, all right, we're just gonna do, we're not gonna cover all of the use cases we know we can think of but it meant that we could actually build it and build it well within the time frame uh, and budget we were looking at building it. And as it turned out, working with uh, Dick and Tim on uh, workspace and multiversion, that other 15% is being handled by that combination. And in fact, we're able to integrate workbench moderation into those modules as well so that that high-end use case can get taken care of by the combination of modules. Um, and I think that really helped to just have that coordination of saying, by the way, we're gonna to wanna to do this thing in six weeks. Keep that in mind as you're building this standalone, technically smaller version system. So um, yeah, make, making that scope call was a, you know, was a risk, but it worked out because we had that coordination with others working in the same space. That's great, thanks Larry. Uh, Dick? So just to touch on what Larry said there, so we had our own initiative already going when we came into the program. Um, so for us, the opportunity was really just what Larry said there. The, the opportunity to collaborate together with other people in the community. Because um, that, how strange it might sound, that doesn't necessarily happen naturally. 
IRC, issue queues, and so on, doesn't necessarily give people the opportunity to get on a call, have someone that organizes that, pulling people together. So that was super useful. Uh, and something that might not have happened if we just had our own initiative going. Um, so that was really, to answer the first question there, um, that was what got me really excited, uh, excited um, that collaboration opportunity. And for the, for, the sec uh, for the last question, did collaboration within the, uh, the map team accelerate your efforts? No, it slowed us down <laughs> a lot. But Great. for the very, very right reasons. Um, we, had, we were just pushing the button almost to publish beta versions of our modules, uh, I think in November or something like that, back in November. That just got ripped up. All of that got ripped up. But again, for the very right reasons. So we sort of d dove into a per period after uh, you know, touching base with everyone else, saying, OK, we need to re-architecture a few things here to make this work better across the, the spectrum of modules that we're working on. And I'm super happy with the outcome. Um, it did delay us. It did sort of set up some internal goals that we initially had. But again, for the very right reasons. Um, so. It uh, didn't necessarily accelerate, but it, the outcome is way better. And I sets like us up much better for the future. Yeah. Uh, did you want to uh, talk about uh, where multiversion might be going and uh, its, its potential inclusion into core? Because there were some really powerful outcomes out of that slowing yeah. down process. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so during this whole process, uh, getting out more in the community, talking to uh, contrib developers, talking to more core committers, etc. There's been a lot of excitement around the combined functionality of many modules. So there's a, there's a suite of modules that we're talking about here. Uh, workbench moderation, multi-version, and there's a module called Workspace, and, and the deploy module itself. Um, that sort of combined suite of modules has turned into an official core initiative that Dries announced during the the keynote today, uh, of which uh, I'm supposedly the, the initiative coordinator. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's super exciting, uh, which means that there is a commitment uh, in the, in, uh, with the core committers and the, in the uh, general community as well to, to make this happen. Um, Great. So the, the, the lots of details here just need to be figured out, of course, and, and so on, but that's, that's super exciting. Excellent. And, and that was very much an outcome of, of the collaboration that happened over the past couple of months, I think. Great. So, Ted, I know, oh, Ted, I know you have stories to share, even though you're shy, so. <laughs> um, so I worked on a few modules. I think one sort of interesting related to the question was scheduled updates. And probably one of the ways I, would, I developed it differently because of the program was, um, you know, initially it was for scheduling workbench moderation updates. But um, with a lot of the changes in D8, everything moving to fields and stuff like that, is that you know we're able to make a module that you know just basically schedules the updates of fields. And I think I don't think I would have probably made it as generalized if I wasn't working on a larger team and getting more feedback. And sort of with uh, if I was making it just for myself for contrib in my spare time, or if I was making it for a client who had you know, a specific really small need to schedule something, um, I probably wouldn't have made the time to make it a more generalized module to say, you know, schedule all the things. Um, so I think, I hopefully it will be useful, you know, in other aspects of just, uh, just work bench moderation. Um, as far as collaboration with other team members, I, I think it really helped because, you know, I work in Contrib a lot, and you know, you do get feedback um, from people when you post issues or something, or, or they post issues, but usually not in an especially timely manner. Um, so you might just have to make a decision, you know, post some feedback, or post some, an issue to get feedback, but you don't get feedback, so you just kind of make the decision on your own. Um, so to be able to have that daily call where, you know, hey, I was thinking about doing this with the module, where somebody might look at something, or they just might, you know, just the 10 or 15 minutes to, put an idea out there and people say, oh no, don't do it that way, do it some other way, or yeah, that's a, that's a good way to do it. I think um, made the work across the different modules that I made better, 
um, and probably accelerated stuff because I probably didn't go down as many dead end paths that I might have if I didn't get the feedback and just like, oh, I'll just try this way and I'll try that way and you know, eventually find the, the way that I think works, but I probably would have hit a lot of more dead ends in that process. Um, and I think also because it was in such early stages of D8 that it, all of that collaboration was more useful than it maybe would have been if it was, if D8 had been out for, you know, two years, is because they're, you know, it's hard to know all the different problems or uh, changes in D8, so having people who worked on core and worked on contrib modules to sort of ask questions right away, I think the, yeah, the benefit of, of being part of that team was a, was a lot more, was a lot more important because of the time that it happened. Uh, not that it wouldn't be important in two years, but it's, it was even more important that it happened, you know, starting in November, as far as getting a trip. Larry? Yeah, just to piggyback on that, one of the, I think, really nice outcomes of this process is, you know, Drupal A's is still new. A lot of the, you know, recommended patterns are different in, in eight than in seven, the way you would go about tackling the problem is different. And having a number of different people at a number of different places in the process of ramping up to Drupal eights who can all collaborate on figuring out, okay, which of these seven ways is probably the best way given Drupal eight for a problem was, I think, invaluable. Just saying, oh, I, coming from Drupal seven, I would never have thought to take that approach to solve this kind of problem, but that totally works because Drupal eight. And you know, that kind of taking, you know, being able to take the time and establish those best practices for Drupal 8 means that the modules we were working on, you know, had the eyes of a half dozen senior level people looking at the architecture together and saying, all right, this, this approach will work, this approach won't work because Drupal 8, this approach, you know, totally works now because Drupal 8 uh, and lets us collectively figure out what those are rather than all coming to slightly different conclusions um, over the course of the next six months and then nothing being consistent. So a lot of things that I, even I wouldn't have thought of doing, working with the other people on, um, on the map team and other people from Palantir who are working on it, um, we're able to say, you know, what, what's the nice D8 way of doing this? Okay, let's all do it the same way. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the concepts that, uh, that was really strong in terms of changing architectures uh, was the idea of the plug-in system, and we, we found this with the uh, Workspace Preview system uh, that, that we're, we're uh, looking at integrating into Lightning. You know, Lightning might have a slightly different use case to other people who are using the module set uh, that, that Dick and Tim are building out, and uh, when we're thinking about systems of resolving conflicts of content, it's really specific, uh, but because we have a way to build a generalized module uh, and then, and then, integrate, and then uh, build out certain methods uh, to, to decide, you know, uh, how this particular project needs to approach that problem. Uh, it gave us a much more generalized architecture. David, uh, you uh, worked uh, with us on panels, and uh, David uh, also still building Panoply and are involved and... Yeah, I'm one of the co-maintainers of Panoply. Uh, we are still pushing forward relatively slowly on Panoply for Drupal 8. Uh, if you're coming to the sprints on Friday, uh, we're definitely going to be working more on Panoply for Drupal 8 and all the panels ecosystem modules. Um, so the effort to bring panels or some sort of block and layout system to Drupal 8 uh, had been going on for a really long time. Um, I've been involved in it for like the past two and a half years. Uh, so when the module acceleration program came around, like we already had an existing team uh, that was already you know executing uh, a roadmap, but relatively slowly, since we were all doing it in our contrib time. Uh, my contribution up until that point was primarily organizational, um, you know, getting everyone together and, you know, figuring out where we are and how we're going to move forward and making sure that everyone talked to each other. Um, this uh, program was awesome because I could finally, like, sit down and write some real code, which was really cool. Um, otherwise, you know, it's trying to find client work to, to fit it in and, um, you know, as if you're doing it just in your sort of community open source time, I mean, I got to write code at sprints. Um, but no, this was really <laughs> cool. Um, you know, we'd been doing it for two years until the acceleration program. Um, you know, we still have a lot of work to do to get the panels ecosystem uh, 
fully feature complete in, in Drupal 8, but we made more progress than we have at any other time during this program. Um, so yeah, it was just super exciting to say, you know, this thing that you're doing in your free time that you love and that you care about, like, hey, you can get paid to do that instead of client work for three months or four months. Um, so yeah, it, I, I think this was a fantastic effort. Great. Um, Adam, I would like you to talk a little bit about uh, our decision around uh, web form. Uh, and then I'd love it if other people would chime in because this is we had to make some tough decisions in terms of what to accelerate, uh, what would have the most impact. You know, we thought about a grid of, <laughs> we thought about a grid of high impact, high difficulty, low impact, low difficulty, uh, and what we could execute and what would make the the most difference uh, with the resource available. Um, so, yeah, we were actually moving forward with the port of web form at one point. I think Ted had already taken that on. He could talk about it a little bit. <laughs> A little bit further. And then what would happen, I think it was a result of the, everybody that's on this panel, plus, plus quite a few more, you know, really thinking it through a little bit more and looking at what we considered our 80% um, uh, use case scenario and what we could achieve with contacting core and contact storage and maybe just a few hours towards polishing those up a little bit. And what we ended up realizing was that our 80% use case was essentially met already. Um, so that was, I don't know how many hundreds of developer hours saved in some regards. Um, we were able to polish up contact to contact storage a little bit, um, meet a couple of use cases that weren't met with those um, with some resources. Um, and now we're waiting on somebody to really need Webform to actually port Webform, which I'm not sure when and if that'll happen. Um, but that was another one. I think that you know, like uh, uh, Lee Roland, you brought up before, is, is identified. You know, there are some things that contact to contact storage don't do. But um, I don't think that those are 80% so yeah, that was a tough decision, and uh, you know, we like we said, we, we were moving forward with it, and I think that we made the right decision by catching it. Yeah, and if we uh, it, it, when we have the questions at the end, uh, you know, I'd love for the audience to put forward uh, their modules that they're interested in, and we can talk about uh, you know whether they're in process or whether uh, whether they are in the priority list, and uh, you know, and, and how we can prioritize them. Uh, does anyone else have anything to say about uh, Webform or that particular kind of dilemma around modules? Another, kind of generalizing that a bit, in many cases there's a module that existed in Drupal 7 that doesn't need to exist in Drupal 8. Or, you know, the 80% of that module that you would have used it for, core can now handle on its own, like contact being one example. And then, is it a better use of time to just make contact and core that extra 20% better, and then web form doesn't exist, contact module is just everything, maybe? You know, there's, there is talk of that, um, but you know, don't look for a particular module name that is is or isn't in D8 yet. Look for functionality and capability that is or isn't ready for D8 yet, because it may be coming from a different angle and be way better and already works. It's just under a different name. So be open to that. Yeah, and uh, you know, one question I've got for the panel is because we we often have clients approach us with a, a list of user stories or functionality. What do you think are the best ways to find out uh, what uh, what modules are out there uh, that potentially fulfill that functionality, uh, knowing that they use something in D7, now they're going to have to look in D8. Uh, what would be your, uh, your way of finding out uh, how to get something done in D8? We'll, we'll let the, talk the, the reason Larry wants me to answer this is because I still write all of our project estimates. Okay. <laughs> and, and so the answer is basically you keep your ear to the ground um, in the contrib space, but you also have to know what core is capable of. So yeah, it's true. I was actually trying to convince WebChick this morning that she didn't need Webform. <laughs> right? She's like, you know, what's going to be the great thing of, of Drupal 8.2? And I'm like, put contact storage in core and say you don't need Webform anymore. She's like, we can't do that. I'm like, yes, you can. It's a marketing problem, not a technical problem. <laughs> we can solve. So, so um, yeah, you. You need to know what core is capable of now. There's some great stuff. I remember seeing uh, Michael Schmidt from, uh, oh, who's he with? Amazing Labs. From Amazing Labs doing a talk about, well, here's what you can do with blocks in Drupal 8, which means I don't need these eight modules anymore, right? That was a great presentation from, from Amsterdam last year. So knowing what's going on in, in core is important. And then, you know, we're at a state now where just sort of watching new module releases as they come out. Some, I was working with some of the Acquia folks on a gigantic RFP last week, and there were like three modules released last, last week that tech, tick requirements off for that project. And it's like, well, great, now I don't have to write that. 
So, I mean, that's really what you have to do. But from a non-technical standpoint, like I said, I was a product owner here, basically telling Larry, don't, no, that's not in scope. Don't do that. <laughs> Let's, it, I'm the one who was advocating for the 75% use case, right? Um, just giving the development team requirements and actual use cases and actual personas. I mean, Dick and I had an argument this morning where he's like, oh, this is really important. And I was like, no, Dick, that's a 10% use case because Pfizer is special and Pfizer is huge. And, you know, 90% of people who use Drupal don't need that feature. So, um, and that's my advice. Have arguments. Got it. Okay. I, I, I'm not saying to have arguments. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm actually saying to present some evidence. Yeah. That says this is the expressed need. Here's who is expressing it, and this is why that's important. Great. Thanks, Ken. Tim, I'm not going to let you escape this process. <laughs> I'm sure AppNovation has an approach for this, so. <laughs> best way I find is, is social media and everybody's tweeting about what they're up to. Um, there are Twitter accounts about core changes and about contrib changes. Um, just keep a, an eye on them and, and see what's being released and see what's, what's getting, uh, getting out there. And um, yeah, there's so much good stuff going on. Yeah. Adam, I know that uh, there was a channel on IRC, uh, D8 Ports as well? Sorry. Yeah, IRC, I was going to say that at the very beginning. Um, not everybody uses IRC, but social media covers that. Um, um, we, we do have a channel, uh, Drupal 8-Ports, um, where most of the members of this team tend to hang out and, uh, and, and, and hash out things. Um, so that's a great space. And people are there generally pretty friendly and, and willing to answer questions that you might have about specific modules, too. Um, so Drupal 8-Ports, yeah. Maybe we could kickstart the hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the follow-up to something that Tim just sort of jogged my memory. This is, again, not a unique problem to Drupal 8. Dries mentioned in his keynote, right? It's like I've seen this cycle over and over again. Um, the first time I ran into this was actually in Drupal 4.5 when NodeQ came out the day I decided I needed it. <laughs> Literally. I was about to write it. I was like, I better see if anyone's done this before. And it was released like an hour later. It was great. So, yeah. again, this is not a unique problem space. And the community knows how to handle it. I do really like you know, this kind of project. It's been very, I've got more to say about that, but we'll let Larry talk. Yeah, just one other note on that. You know, if while working with Drupal 8, uh, you come across, hey, I would have done this thing this hard way in Drupal 7, and now there's this easy way in Drupal 8 that I wouldn't have thought of, please write a blog, get it on Drupal Planet, so that everyone else in the room can read the blog and use the easy way too. Uh, so if you're not following Drupal Planet, follow it. And if you find a way that is, oh, contact module solve this, I don't need web form anymore, or you know, whatever else you run into, tell people about it so that they can benefit from it too, because everyone can give. Yeah. Um, uh, so just uh, three concrete tips that I sometimes use for searching for new functionality and so on. Uh, one, I search Drupal Planet. Um, and then two, I go to drupal.org slash list dash changes, which is a summary of all the change notes in, in Drupal, both draft change uh, notes and published ones. Super good summary, high level summary in sort of uh, natural language that summarizes new functionality. And then I also go to Drupal Association's YouTube channel and just search for a module name and there's there is going to be a presentation about your module there, either how it works in Drupal 8 or why you don't need it because these other things replaces it. So those three things, Drupal Planet, Drupal.org slash list dot changes, dash changes, and then the association's on this YouTube channel. That's Great I tips. Use. I'd like to add to that uh, that Jam has also been running a module of the week program uh, where he highlights modules that are ready to go. Um, and so that's, that's a great place to, uh, to look for modules as well, uh, you know, his blog. Uh, so, you know, I think there's, there's a question in here uh, for Ken. 
which is uh, what effect do you think the program may have had on Palantir, uh, you know, building out uh, Workbench and building out uh, that, that ecosystem? Uh, how, do you, how do you think that, uh, that affects the, your business? I mean, it's really good for, for our business. I'll, I'll say, this goes to what I was, what I was just thinking. Um, I mean, there are three basic models for module development, right? One is a solo developer has a great idea, wants to get it out of her head. She writes it, she releases it. That's a great model. I've done that before. Uh, two is someone comes to you with a requirement and pays you to do that thing. Uh, that can give you some really interesting challenges. The example I'd have is actually for Dave, because in panels for Drupal 7, we had one of the panels contributors on staff at the time. So we have a client site still using like panel 7.1 alpha 2, which then got trashed and forked and never used again. And so it's a dead end code branch and that site is just stuck. So those are both siloed approaches. And then you have something like module acceleration program where it's like, okay, let's take a bunch of people and let them collaborate. And yes, they're working on different things, but again, they're working on the same types of problems. So for instance, even in the work that I've been doing sort of in my side, like I talked to Larry about data storage, which is a very different thing in Drupal. So um, that's been really, really beneficial. And I will also say actually to, to John and Adam's credit, the other thing that uh, Matt gave to us as an agency was some deadlines, right? Deadlines, this is the other dirty little secret, right? Deadlines matter in software development, right? Because without a deadline, you're not going to finish, right? Because you're not gonna make the hard choices you have to make in order to declare something finished. So that's what I think we've been able to do. And what that's gonna do is, again, it's generating a lot of excitement. We're doing a workbench, I'll give you an example, we're doing a workbench webinar, right? The last webinar I did had three attendees. The workbench webinar got two dozen attendees within two hours of its announcement. Right? That'll be on the 24th, by the way. Sign up now. Ballinger.net, yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Is there any, anyone want to add anything? I'm going to skip on probably you know, for, for a couple of minutes to scribe lightning and then get to the questions. Is there any, anything else from the, the panel? Cool. All right, I want to talk to you just for a minute about lightning. Uh, we couldn't have done lightning without map. Uh, so many of the modules uh, that we built in map are, are now in lightning. Um, and it's uh, you know, another way that Acquia is giving back to Drupal. Uh, you know, this is a completely open source distribution. Uh, it's available on Drupal.org and through Composer, um, and it's for enterprise authoring. So that means that it wraps up, wraps up certain functionality. And for Acquia, you know, we by default when we build on Drupal 8, we build with Lightning now. That's not going to be for everyone, uh, but the type of client we have where they need to have sophisticated authoring functionality, that makes sense for us. Um, and really, uh, what, what Lightning does is it serves the developer. Uh, it accelerates the development experience. It gives you that 20% at the beginning uh, to get going. It gives you standards and, and uh, module configurations uh, so that the developer can serve the site builder and the content author and the site designer, uh, giving them the tools they need uh, to build out great experiences. So Lightning is a foundation or a starter kit. It tightly couples uh, over 20 modules uh, and configures them. It's a lightweight framework with documentation and best practice examples uh, for Drupal. Um, and it's really made up of four functional areas, layout, workflow, preview, and media, uh, and, and three uh, development principles, security, integrations, and testing. So layout uh, you know, really wraps up a lot of the work that, uh, that David uh, did for us uh, in, in, uh, in the panels ecosystem and gives you things like uh, drag and drop layouts, changing uh, how many columns you have on a page, being able to create landing pages. Uh, and, and workflow, uh, you know, brings uh, arbitrary workflow states. It's, it's really uh, workbench moderation and configuration that we've brought uh, to, to be able to allow you to put content through a workflow. Uh, you know, in preview, we're going to be bringing from a workspace preview system, which, you know, is, is what uh, Dick and Tim have built out, uh, you know, and, and will be in, in Lightning 1.1. Uh, and media, um, you know, we've got so many people to thank. Uh, for, for media integrations. Uh, there's too many for right now, but the ability to bring in social media uh, into your web experience. Um, so 
Lightning wraps all this up with some automated testing. It's really useful for developers. So we've got bhat tests. So if you're building on top of Lightning, uh, you can actually test whether you've broken any of those modules with their functionalities. And that should mean you can go really fast and set up continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, Lightning's got great adoption. We've had a bunch of people in our, our beta program uh, from large agencies like Miram and VML and Phase 2. Uh, Princeton EDU is going to launch on Lightning in, in the fall, uh, and Water Music is using it for their next big platform. Um, you know, and, and there's lots of, uh, lots of people coming onto Lightning. As I said, Acquia now uses Lightning by default uh, for every build they do uh, on D8. So Lightning's available, available on Dev Desktop. As I said before, Drupal.org through Composer. Um, and there's a lightning.acquia.com site uh, for developers. Uh, so they know how to install it uh, and how to upgrade it, which, by the way, can be a one-line upgrade. Uh, we'll provide an upgrade path between all versions of Lightning. And you basically get functionality for free as we build more into Lightning. Uh, so before, uh, so I, I want to now go into a, a quick Q&A session uh, for the panel. Uh, so if you want to step up. I'm not sure if we have a second microphone. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm just going to see if I can. That's not going to go. OK, so if you step up and ask a question, I'll repeat your question, and then the panel can answer. So if, everyone, if anyone wants to come up uh, right now and uh, form a line at the, at the poll, <laughs> the micless poll. You, if you talk, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to hear you, yeah. <laughs> All right. um, what is the, I mean, there's a workflow module for Drupal 8 right now called Workflow. Um, what makes you guys prioritize like, things like work message moderation and stuff over that kind of feature? So I might let you repeat that one, Larry, just so we've got the question on a record and then you can answer it. The, the, the question was, uh, there's also a module called uh, Workflow. So what, what made us decide to go with workbench moderation over Workflow? Uh, we actually looked at the workflow module and you know, considered using that as a basis. What we decided was a lot of the functionality was similar between that and workbench moderation, but it had enough other things tightly coupled on top of it that we would have had to rip off in a sense, and that would also add another dependency that we didn't want to bring in. Uh, so it, it ended up being less work to just have our own states and transitions, and then layer our own functionality on top of that, rather than trying to fight what another the assumptions another module is already making. Um, I would love to see just the states and transitions concept become its own thing. Um, spoiler: we, that's something we've been talking about may end up in core at some point as just a thing on its own, and then. If you want to extend that in Contria, then you have a more common baseline for it. That, that was basically the thinking there was uh, you know, fewer dependencies to have to work around. And just let, let's just get this thing working nicely. We actually brought the uh, developer yeah. into a couple of meetings, too. I think it's worth noting. We, we did some collaboration. And I think we kind of mutually decided that these were two independent projects, just for the record, yeah. Great. Thanks. Adam, or do you want to re re uh, reiterate the questions just so we've got it on the mic? Yeah, so the question was uh, Drupal Commerce are using external libraries, and have we found any, any uses for external libraries and stuff that we're doing? And it was not so much have you found uses for them, it was more like in their case with currency. That was right. something that they were able to say, this is a use case we have that tons of other people have. Did you find any opportunity to take things that were like, oh, we've solved this problem? So the one thing that we've been doing with uh, our deploy modules, uh, so multi-version workspace and deploy, is we allow cross-site uh, content staging. So you can have a staging site and a production site and move your content between them. For this, we're using CouchDB's API. And we've got uh, a couple of external libraries that we're using for that. Uh, one of them is a PHP replicator, uh, which 
uses the same protocol as CouchDB to replicate content, but it's all written in PHP. Uh, this uses then a CouchDB client, which is a, a doctrine project, so we've also been contributing back to that as well. Um, so we include this into the Relax module uh, via Composer um, as external PHP libraries. Uh, the replicator was actually done as a Google Summer of Code project last year. Uh, so Dick men mentored a, a student last year for Google Summer of Code. And we're planning to do the same again this year. We've got another Google Summer of Code project, and we're looking at building out a, a conflict uh, management system. So when you're replicating content between sites or between workspaces on the same site, we'll both be able to flag up and resolve conflicts with an external uh, PHP library that can, uh, that can solve these conflicts. Great. Is there anyone in the room? Ha oh, yeah, we got another question. So the question was, what's missing from contact and contact storage? Um, so I made entity form for Drupal 7. So I think I, I made sort of like the alternative that does the 80%. But I think the thing that web form does really well, there's a couple things. One, having tons of forms. Um, and two, having some forms that have just tons and tons of fields. Um, so the fact that contact or entity form or eform would use the field system is going to bring some complications if you have like a 500,000 um, uh, field form, which apparently happens. Um, because <laughs> th uh, there are some, like there's a big issue uh, on, Dru on web form about porting to Drupal 8. Um, there's a really long discussion about like the benefits and should we just make it all bundles and fields and you know the you know I sort of put my two cents in there and I think the general consensus was you know it, it would kind of be too you'd lose some of the functionality if you did that so I would think anytime you're thinking of like forms as content on your site I feel like con the contact form solution maybe falls down a little bit because you know, contact forms are config entity, your fields are config entities. So if you really want to hand off making forms to your clients right now, I don't, I'm not sure that contact and contact storage is um, the way to go. And I was sort of one of the people that talked them out of porting Webform, basically. They hired me and Webform was the first project and I said, oh, you don't need it and please hopefully give me something else to work on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think but I, it's hard to say like what percentage that use case is. Um, but I think a lot of people use Webform in Drupal 7 for stuff that wasn't necessarily where Webform was great for. So if I, my feeling is if you have, if your forms are gonna be made by site builders, um, then maybe Webform is not the way to go. But if your forms are made by your clients on an ongoing basis without necessarily contact with you, or you know, a Drupal developer. It seems like that's where web form really shines. Yeah. So the short answer to that question was: if you really wanted web form in the map project, blame Ted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. I mean. So, I think, Re repeat it, Ted. Repeat yeah, so, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he was reading some of the contact uh, comments on Dries' last post about, uh, con I don't forget what it was. Uh, <laughs> about about the better interface uh, that he potentially had through Webform. And that yeah. might actually be with Form Builder that you're talking about, which is an extension to Webform. Yeah. I yeah. think, but, but the, I think there's a gotcha to that is Webform, when you make fields, is not making tables in your database. Anything else you do, is making fields in your database. So I think the idea that you pass off, you could clean up the field UI and make it sort of simple, and there was like a, a attempt at that in D7. 
but if you clean it up and make it easy and pass it off to your clients, you're not cleaning up the fact that underneath they're making tables in your database and they're scaling, I think they're scaling issues, I'm probably not the best person to speak on that, but you're yeah. doing something, even if you change the interface, you're doing something fundamentally different with any other, basically any other form system in Drupal besides Webform. On Webform, like, it's not producing new tables, every, you know, all the submissions go in the same place, mm. um, whereas contact storage and eForm and any form in Drupal 7, like every time you make a new field, you're making two new tables and, right. yeah, so it's a whole different sort of storage. And I think just cleaning up the field just cleaning up the field UI or making a form builder on top of the field UI to make it easier for clients is not really, I feel like almost you're opening up a can of worms. That, oh, I, you know, I made the field uh, UI a whole lot easier, now I'm gonna pass it off to my clients and I don't think you're passing off something to your clients that they don't- Larry vigorously the shakes his head. Implications of. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So are there any other modules uh, that you're interested in specifically from the audience anyone want to raise? Any particular modules that you think should be prioritized? Uh, you think we should be thinking about going forward apart from web form? <laughs> anyone in the audience? Yes? Organic groups? Is that already in the program? Organic groups. It is not currently in the program. Uh, we suffered a similar... Oh, Ted, you want to... Tell them why we're not including it? No, Again, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that. I don't know that. I know, have you looked at the groups module? It seems like a lot of people like the groups module. I mean, I love organic, organic groups. It's crazy flexible, but it's also hard to configure. And it, I'm not sure that everybody needs the crazy flexibility. I haven't actually used the group module myself, but I've talked to a lot of people who really sort of like it. And it basically the... Main difference is groups are their own type of entity, whereas in organic groups, you add a group field and you can make anything a group. So organic groups, I think still, they're developing it, but you know. They are developing it, yes. Yeah, it gives you crazy amounts of flexibility, but there is something out there now if you needed something group-like, but you know, you, if you look at the groups module and say, hey, this does what we yeah. you know, need. And it seems like, I, you know, there's a podcast on, on modules unraveled the developer talks about it. So it seems like it was built in a pretty sane way. So, and it's, you know, it's fieldable, you know, and I think re, uh, memberships are fieldable and stuff like that. So you do get some of the flexibility of group of organic groups. It's just not the flexibility to say, hey, I want this user to be a group. Great. Or a term to be a group. Thanks, Ted. Got a question out the back, yeah? Drupal console. Okay, okay, interesting. I don't think we've got any comments on that. We haven't uh, thought about uh, Drupal console yet being a command line tool rather than a... a yeah, it's been brought up. Um, it's been talking stick, Adam. <laughs> yeah, it's been brought up before and I know you've reached out to me directly um, and we're definitely interested in that. It's not something, that's something that we need to discuss. Let's talk, yeah, <laughs> let's talk. <laughs> It'll so, fit the strict definition of uh, what we've previously put in the module acceleration yeah. program, but um, I personally think it's very worthy and I'd be interested to find exactly what we're looking, yeah. what, what it needs to get pushed across the finish line. So just to wrap up, uh, unless we've got anyone with a burning module they want to talk about, no? Okay, great. Uh, so just to wrap up, Adam, you probably got an idea of a couple of the modules we have coming out fairly soon. Uh, and in our roadmap and things that we're focusing on, we've just brought on uh, MD Systems are going to be working with us, and Commerce guys have just signed up to work with us. Uh, so we've got some amazing developers, uh, you know, who, who are coming on uh, to build out some of the media ecosystem. And uh, Adam, do you want to? Yeah, not, not so many real media modules anymore. Like a lot of the big, big ones are, were done by the people that are sitting up here, but Fast 404 is Ultimate Cron, um, and then a lot of like pushing across the finish line stuff in the media world, the drop zone module in the media world. Um, there's, there's over a dozen modules in the media world right now that we're looking to push across, but those in Ultimate Cron, Fast 404s. Um, yeah, so we hope that that will spin into the media initiative as well and, and really help drive that forward. Uh, so if you'd all give a big hand to these guys, they've done a hell of a lot to advance the module ecosystem, um, and they're really fantastic developers. Uh, thank you much, there. Oh, we've got one more. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Dick. Uh, and me and Tim, we've been sitting here sort of representing the multi-version workflow yes. deploy modules. 
but we also have Andre here in, in the room. He's done a huge amount of work on these modules as well. So he's sitting here in the front row. Give him. Thank you very much. Great. And Larry? Let's get around for the uh, creative team who's coordinating all of this stuff and turning we cats. So. Oh, thanks. John and Adam. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much for coming along.